at her, widely translated and anthologized. Her recent volume of poetry, When God is a Traveler, was a season choice of the Poetry Book Society, shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. She's the recipient of many awards and fellowships, including the inaugural Kushan Singh Prize, the Raza Award for Poetry, the Z Indian Women's Award for Literature, and a long list. She has written extensively on culture and spirituality and has worked over the years as critic, poetry editor and curator. Um, she has several books out as well and most of her books have gone into several reprints. As editor, her most recent book is the acclaimed Penguin Anthology of Bhakti Poetry, Eating God. It is surprisingly available in the bookshops outside. Surprisingly. <laughs> Surprising. Prabhupada Yoon was born in Bangkok and studied in the United States from the age of 15. After graduating with a BFA in finance from the Cooper Union in New York City, he returned to Thailand for a six-month military service and started to write short stories immediately after his discharge. His, discharge. his first book was the story collection Moa Moon Chak in 2000, which is the city of right angles. Uh, Na Ja Pen, Probability, another story collection was published the same year and won the prestigious SEA Write Award. He has been widely credited with popularizing postmodern writing in Thailand. His book, Probability, is regarded as a landmark book in contemporary Thai literature. Since then, he has written and published numerous story collections, novels, essays, song lyrics, and screenplays. His writings have been translated to Japanese, English, Spanish, Italian and Chinese. He is also the Thai translator of Western modern classics such as Lolita, Clockwork Orange and uh, all of J.D. Salinger's books. In 2017, the sad part was his first book in English was published, becoming the first translation of Thai fiction to be published in the UK. This was followed in 2018 by a second English book, Moving Parts. Apart from writing, he is also an acclaimed designer of book covers and film directors. So <laughs> I look forward to a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, there are many reasons why I've been looking forward to this conversation. One is, of course, the fact that Prabhda seems to be a man of many parts, and I think it's going to take uh, half an hour is definitely not enough to unravel those. But for another, in a conversation with him this morning, I discovered that this is not a good mic. Yeah. It sort of comes and goes all the Does this does this work? Yeah. Yeah. morning I discovered uh, yet another source of kinship, which is, uh, or the only source of kinship so far actually. The bit about um, straddling multiple forms is, uh, is certainly not a source of kinship. But what we did discover this morning is that we both um, constantly look for strategies to be hermits in urban landscapes. So while we derive nourishment from those urban landscapes, we also are constantly looking for ways to withdraw from it. So that interested me. And then there is Pravda himself. I've uh, enjoyed his presence in the past couple of days. We haven't talked very much at all. But there is a certain quiet and a certain self-containment about him, which uh, makes me curious. So that seems like the starting point of a conversation that I'm looking forward to. Yeah? How does it, um, what does it really mean to be a, a writer, a designer, a visual artist, a filmmaker, and a translator? Is it actually, my question would really be, is it really possible to straddle all these forms with the same, bringing the same degree of rigor to your practice of each? I ask this also because I've, uh, I do poetry primarily and some measure of prose, but never fiction. And whenever I've been asked why not fiction or why not short fiction or whatever else, 
my response is always that it takes me, it's taking me forever to figure out poetry. That's fine. I think we are mic'd out. Just okay. speak a little. It works? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it seems to take forever to figure out one form. And whenever I've been asked about other languages, it always seems to me that I've taken forever to figure out English and I'm still trying to crack it. What does it really mean to be a practitioner of so many? How do you do it? Um, to be honest, I think it means that I'm still a child because everything that I do relates back to my childhood. Um, that's why it makes it really difficult for me to give advice to people because I, I, didn't, I never felt like I became these things that I, that I am now. I, I just felt like it's a continuity of what I was doing when I was young. You know, I, I, was a, I was a quiet um, boy, shy, awkward, um, and I would just read a lot and I would draw a lot and I would make my own magazine and I would make my own poster of uh, imaginary movies that I would direct one day. So everything I'm doing now is basically like what I was doing then but in real life. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's really difficult for me to, to say to anybody like how to become a writer or a filmmaker or an artist because I've always been doing it and I just got lucky that that after college, I started doing all these things that I was already doing, um, and I was able to make a living out of them. Um, so it feels a lot of times like not working, <laughs> which is which is good. Yes, I know that you say often that uh, you see yourself as a storyteller, whether it's a storyteller who uses images or a storyteller who uses words, it's not so different. Right, because I feel like I'm not, uh, you know, like I, <coughs> writing is uh, for me the most challenging of all the activities that I do. Um, but it's also the most satisfying once I'm finished, you know, because painting or, you know, any other kind of art, I feel like I can do it pretty much any, at any time and I feel like there, the satisfaction comes quite e much easier. Um, I can be done with a painting and then I feel, you know, I can put it away and I'm okay with it. But writing is, I'm never really happy with it. I, j I just have to tell myself it's done, you know, or I have to give myself a deadline or something like that. Otherwise, I would just, it would just take years and years to finish one story because I would never be really happy. But, um, but so it's, so I, I, I tend to seek other activities while I'm writing. You know, after a while I get anxious and I want to to do something else. That's, and that's why also I make films and sometimes I I make other kinds of art. Uh, only because I, I feel like I need to do other things while, while I'm writing to, to get inspired in, in different other ways. And in every every single one of them is all involves storytelling. And that's, that's why I feel like what I'm really interested in, interested in is telling stories, not really in a particular form. I, I could live without writing. I yes, you, you know, I, I read this interview with Prabhda where he says that, uh, and tell me if you still stand by that, right. you say you see yourself primarily as a visual artist. You may be better known as a writer, but you see yourself primarily as a visual artist. Is that true? I've always felt that way. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really know why, but um, everything comes visually first to me. So when I think about a story, I, I see, I see the, the scenes and I see the characters and I see how things unfold in that story. Uh, I see the cover sometimes, I see the cover. <laughs> um, as in film, you know, like I see the posters, I see the, I see the, uh, the imagery, I see you know, so, so I'm a very visual person, but I, I also fell in love with uh, language at one point. So that's it's a kind of combination. So when it comes to writing, um, I tend to see the whole, the whole package, not just the, the writing part. 
you said earlier that um, you know maybe this is the, the impact of your the background in design on storytelling, but you said you're not terribly interested in character development and uh, plot and those sort those aspects, those devices. That he's far more interested in idea and perhaps image. I'm not sure whether it's distilling a moment in a particular way. And I was looking at, uh, well, I haven't had the chance to read, to read these stories yet. I was just looking at the descriptions of some of these stories to just give you a whiff of what they might be like. These are the stories. In a big walled motel, a teenage prostitute brings a grown man to tears. A love-struck young boy holds the dismembered hand of his crush, only to find himself the object of a complex menage à trois. A naked body falls from the window of a 20-story building, while two female office workers offer each other consolation in the elevator. To me, this sort of, um, even the, the whiff of the story in, in images like these, it excites me perhaps mainly because it is an image. I mean, there's an instant image there. So, um, well, there are two questions here. One is, would you talk about what it is about the process? I mean, when you said it's certain aspects of your design background has, have made you approach storytelling differently, how is that? And two, lead us through some of the process of writing. When I say that I'm not interested in... Can you hear them? No. Okay. <coughs> need to switch that on. Hello? Yeah. I mean, it works, but yeah. is it better? Good project. Okay, okay. I'll just uh, hold it a little bit. Like, like a rock star. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Hey! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I say that I'm not interested in literary values, it's not like I, that I don't respect them. I mean, I, I I admire people who write really big books with really uh, complicated plots and characters and stuff like that. It's just that I don't I don't have the talent for it, and I mean probably I'm too lazy also to, <laughs> to write a long you know elaborate story. So um, I get inspired by moments, you know, like and that can happen at any time. Uh, the, the past three, four days I've been here have been moments that could have inspired uh, some stories. So I find that uh, more suitable for my, my, my ability to, to create something. Um, and and that's, that's also the part of the process, is, is recognizing these moments and then expanding on them later somehow. So sometimes I use these moments um, in different kinds of art forms, not necessarily just a writing. You know, many of them are, are more easier to express writing, but um, some of them are too abstract, also to really um, make it to language. So I use that in painting or sculpture or something. Sculpture? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff. You know, when, when that, that introduction makes it sound like I do, you know, it's like this incredible thing that I'm doing so many things, but it's really not that that big a deal because <laughs> because in, in, in Thailand it's not that difficult to, to do so many things. We all copy. No, 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 but, you know, not successfully in everything. But you can do those things if you, if you, um, I don't know, manage your time more. No, let's go back to this. You went, <laughs> you went to study fine art in yes. the U.S. Yes, So you saw yourself at that point as someone who was... I never thought that writing or being a writer was, 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 was a real job. You know, I never, I never felt... Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I never felt, I, I mean I love to write and to read, but I always thought that I would have to go to school for something practical that I could come out and, and, and be, you know, in advertising or something, for example. Um, so, 
So I went to art school for that reason. Not that I wasn't interested in art in art school already, but, uh, but I, I felt that that was more practical. Although I wanted to, to, to be a filmmaker more, or, or a writer more, I, I thought I could always write somehow, like on the side or as a, as a hobby. You know. Damning comment on the college tests. But, uh, no, so you went off, was this New York? It was, well, I went to high school in, in Massachusetts, okay. and then I went to college in New York. All right. And you returned at the age of 26? Yes. What did that period away from Thailand mean to you? It was like uh, limbo for me, almost, because I didn't really want to go back. I had to go back because of the service. Um, all Thai males have to do the military service, and they can sort of postpone it up until 26. So I graduated at 26 exactly, and I, I had to go back for this. So, so during that time, I really sort of put my life on hold, and I just wanted to see what, what you know, future would bring, or what military service would bring uh, into my life. What did it bring? Almost nothing. That's why I, I started to write again. <laughs> <laughs> because they had in the service, you couldn't read, and they didn't allow you to write. So I felt this frustration um, every day. I mean, it was really boring. You, you think like people always have this image of being, being in the military is very tough, or you know something like that. But it's really just like waking up early, jogging for an hour or so. And then just like sitting around making jokes and you know uh, <laughs> keeping your your uh, whatever you call them the the majors or the, the massages. So yes, they make you do stuff. <laughs> they make you run chores and change channels on the television. So uh, it's, it's really it's really it's really boring. And that was all kind of an inspiration to. Right. No, not, no, 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 right. You can give massage, yeah, 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 but yeah. you cannot write. No. I For couldn't some read? Reason. You couldn't read, they didn't, they didn't allow books. It's your wall You can so, surf channels, but you cannot read. No, no. Okay. So it was a lot of sitting around, uh, <laughs> picking out the, you know. My, my camp was actually in, in Bangkok. But it was in an isolated part, so so uh, uh, in our free time, a lot of people were just like looking out, the, you know, out onto the streets and see people walking by and stuff like that. It, it was just like that. So so afterwards, I, I started to write right away. I became like very prolific because of there was so much like you know coming out after that. So I guess. In retrospect, it was a good thing to go to the military service. Um, it was yes, it was one year. It was like three months of boot camp, and then the rest was working, so-called working for the military. Um, yeah, so I started to write right afterwards, and still also looking for you know like a full-time job. Um, but um, I, I wrote a lot, and I, and I started to write film essays that became quite, um, I don't know, well received by, by the readers. So one thing led to another, and I started to write a lot, and, and my books were published like two years after that. Um, and this one actually won the, the C Wright Award. Um, a year after it came out. So, you know, I, then I became a writer. It was, it was kind of, it worked out like that for me. And did the military experience actually fuel stories? Not yet. <laughs> Maybe coming up, coming soon. <laughs> but do you see yourself as someone who was likely to work largely with short fiction, not the novel? I've, I've written novels, I've written five novels. <laughs> But <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how old you are. I'm 45. So I'm not that young. I mean, I... I, I <laughs> Why is that funny? Is it young? It's absurdly oh, young. Oh, okay. It's 
45 you start thinking about a novel. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I started early, I guess, 2027, 20, I started to learn. <laughs> you seem in shock. Right. <laughs> because it's, I'm now trying to process this. I thought we were leading in a particular direction, but I guess we're opening up a whole lot of others. Rather, you have achieved the impossible. Yeah. <laughs> but um, do you want to talk a little about the novels? Because I'm going to actually move into filmmaking, but now you've picked up the novel. Um, well, it's hard to talk about, no, you know, nobody's read them, so it's hard to talk about them. You know, not about what they're, uh, what would you like to say about them? Why do you write novels? When you can paint, you can write short stories, you can make films. No, the novel writing is, to me, the top challenge. It's, it's like the, you know, painting a mural, like a big, yeah. and so I, I, I've always wanted to, to try to write. And, um, and I knew that one day I would have to write a novel, so, so I, so I wrote. No, Why do you have to write a novel? Just as a question. Why? What do you have to? Parents? No, be, because it's different. I mean, I think writing a novel is uh, like a journey. is um, is much more difficult for me at any rate than to than to write a short story. And once you've finished or or you know when you've read an, a good novel, you feel fulfilled by it, by it, and you feel like. Um, it, it's, if it's a, a good one or the one that you like, it stays in your memory and it's, it becomes part of you much more than a short story, I think. Short stories are like sweets. And if, I mean, they're, they're, they're fun and they're, some of them can be very memorable, but um, in the end it's the novel that, is, that has some kind of depth <coughs> and stays with you. <laughs> Where does uh, filmmaking come into this? But wait a minute, before we get to filmmaking, I want to pause with translation, because I heard that you've translated Lolita, you translated Catcher in the Rye, Clockwork, trans orange. Clockwork Orange. How did you Clockwork Orange? Like you're 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I decided not to, I mean, I decided to make up words in Thai instead of trying to translate from the you know, Russian invented language or whatever the, the original was, yeah. <coughs> but what were the challenges? Were there challenges in transposing Holden um, Caulfield to Bangkok? Yes, of course. And also, is Caulfield is like, you know, America in the 50s. And it's different from America at the moment. Um, so I had to make a choice of whether to try to, find, to make it feel like Thailand in the 50s, which didn't make any sense to me, um, or to make it contemporary, and I decided to, to go with the latter, um, and to use words that are, that the Thai, the young people speak. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I feel that literature has power when it speaks um, with kind of an immediacy, so if you read it now, you want to feel it's related to the situations that are going on in your life or, or in society. So I, 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 don't, I don't really, um, I don't know, I, I always choose to say it in a way that it, it speaks to the contemporary people. And humbled, humbled. Yeah, that was painful. <laughs> that was a really painful experience. But it was also rewarding because I feel like translate, translating Nabokov is taking a course, uh, teaching you a lot. And um, he's, a, he's a great teacher, I think. I, I don't necessarily feel like his work is as, as great as people say they are. Some of them are still so, in my opinion. But he has such passion. Um, a genius in, in his writing that is is good for a translator or for for writers to read him because there's so much inspiration in, in, in just his prose alone. 
It's just beautiful prose. Yeah, but did you uh, adapt that as well? Yeah, but, but Lolita is difficult because there's so many allusions to English literature or, um, or to Russian stuff or whatever. So I, I couldn't really keep most of them in the Thai translation because it just wouldn't make any sense. There would, would have to be too many um, uh, like footnotes and things like that. So I, you know, made some ch choices that are probably not uh, uh, admirable for <laughs> the professional translator. <laughs> How were they received? I think pretty well for something that is uh, heavy and thick and expensive, you know. For, but so it's been published three times in, in Thailand, so it's, it's doing okay. Also, one Korean pop star uh, puts it in his list of, you know, like uh, ten, 10 books to read. Or whatever. So, K pop is huge in Thailand and it helps. <laughs> it helps for some reason. Lolita and K-pop are related now. <laughs> <laughs> and you write songs too, in fact, right? Some, man. It is, it's not this song. Some songs, some songs. Did you actually work with a musician? Yes, yes, sometimes. Yes. You have a band? Um, I have two. I have only two bands. Two bands. Two you make us look very tiny. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Two bands in Bangkok? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And it's different kinds of music. Yes, different. One is folk. Another one is uh, more electronic based music. So the kind of lyrics you write would be different for each? Not really, not really. I, I play with words and things. So the lyrics are kind of wordplay and short, short stories, usually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> moving from um, the frozen image to the moving image, how did that happen? Um, <coughs> this was kind of an accident. Um, I, I had written screenplays for uh, another uh, well-known Thai film director called Pinay Radhanarayam. And um, so I got to know the film industry a little bit, like the uh, production people mostly. Um, so I have friends in, in that industry. And, and two years ago, three years ago, another filmmaker wanted to turn one of my stories into a film. So he came to me and we talked about that particular story. And I just said, yeah, you know, I'd rather write you a new one. Because I don't really, when I write a story or a book, I don't see, I mean, I, it's not my intention to turn any of it into film. So it's a little bit strange for me to have to see my stories turn into a film. So I said, I'm going to write you another story. I'm, I'm going to give you a synopsis. So I, I went away and I sent him a synopsis of uh, called Motel Miss. Um, and he didn't like it. He said, I still want to use that story you talked about. So I have this story lying around, um, and it so happened that a good friend of mine had just graduated from NYU film school. She returned to Thailand, and I showed her this story. Um, and she had already made some films with, with the people in the industry. And she showed this synopsis to a producer, and the producer showed it to the investor. And the investor said, yeah, okay, we'll try, you yeah. So that's how I got to make my first film, which is called Motel Mist. Um, which has gone to several international films. So, so it came about in that way. I didn't really, you know, a lot of people, they want to make a film, they put a lot of effort into, you know, like, going to investors, having meetings, and so I didn't go through a lot of that. Um, it happened very fast, and yeah, so I... It, <laughs> Did you just write, you directed it? I directed it also, yes. <laughs> Did you act? No, no, I didn't act. <laughs> 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 
I didn't buy your own music. I did sign the poster though. I did. You did? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Tell me, you claim that at least this morning, yes. you claim that you have this strongly reclusive streak. This, that you were a hermit. Yes, hermit. yes, yes, yes. Why would a hermit want to enter into this terribly collaborative business? I didn't, I didn't want to. But you did it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like one of those things that you, that I wanted to do so much as a child. You know, like I saw, I watched a lot of films, I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was young. And when I had a chance to do it, I just had to do it. I just had to say, I'll, I'll try it. Because otherwise I would have gone through life regretting not taking that opportunity. So that's why I did it. And, um, and it was, you know, well received in some circles. So it gave me some uh, ambition to go further to make another film and maybe to, to make more. Um, yeah, it just happened that way. I, I still don't like to work with too many people, so it's a little bit uncomfortable. One of the wonderful things about being a writer, and yeah. like, presumably an artist, is that that solitariness yes, is yes, never compromised. It's the most comfortable yeah. for me also, yeah. yes. Yeah. So when, when I'm not working on a film, I almost never go anywhere. And I'm just, you know, working in my, in my house. <laughs> Um, so I make, I make the effort of socializing and, go, and working with other people and playing nice, and, you know, things like that. It's more than Actually, films is good because it ends, yes. you know, like, so you have to do it for um, a year or something, or six months, uh, as, uh, if, if it goes well. Um, and then you can just do other things. So it's, it's, it's nice in a way. But I do know that your first film was actually withdrawn at one point from the cinemas. Is it that your investors had cold feet? Mm, it was really personal, I think. I believe that it was just him, the, the, the guy who had the authority to, to say, it, you know, we're not going to show this movie. And why? I think because he felt that my film would just like give him, give his family a bad stain. <laughs> his reputation. Violent, sexually explicit. Yeah, he had nudity mm -hmm. and it was kind of kinky, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also that period was the mourning period of the um, former king who died. Uh, it was just like two or three weeks after he had passed away. Um, 2014? Uh, no, 16, 16. And the film was kind of, you know, not a sweet, uh, small, not not sweet film. So I think he felt like he could get in trouble if he if he let it be shown in the theaters also. And then he changed his mind. No, we we had we negotiated, and we said, uh, give us this movie and we'll make you another one um, to replace it. Oh. So that's what we did, actually. He gave us the rights to the movie, so we screened it anyway. Um, and I had to make it another film, which was kind of stupid. Like, when you were like, why do you have to do this again? But, yeah. But we, we, we believed in our first film, and we didn't want it to just, like, disappear. And it was well received in Thailand as well? Mm, in some circles, I would say, yes. You know, because I know nothing about Thai cinema, my question is really, what does it mean to be an independent filmmaker in Thailand today? Um, it's incredibly difficult, because it's, um, it's hard to find support. Um, especially once the film is done, it's really hard to find uh, theaters that would show the film for, for a long period of time. So, you know, like the nature of uh, film goers who like to watch independent films, they don't rush to the theaters like the first weekend that it comes out. People don't need time. Sometimes they don't even know that the film is already out. So, uh, independent films need uh, kind of space where they can have a long showcase 
of their work, but that doesn't, there's almost no space like that in Thailand. So it's really difficult, um, which is unfortunate because more and more talented young filmmakers are, you know, uh, popping up all the time now in Thailand. And I, I think they, there is some kind of frustration that that they don't get to to use their creativity to the fullest. I think, I mean, you'll throw this open very soon to the audience, but um, I'm trying to think of, I'm curious about one thing, and maybe I'll ask you this before we open it up. What does it mean to be a liberal in Thailand today? <coughs> An artist. I mean, I mean, you can be a liberal in Thailand if you don't... Uh, If you stay in your sort of community, if you don't uh, go in the public, and if you're not so loud about it, then you can be a liberal pretty safely. Uh, but if you write or if you express your liberal ideals too loudly, uh, you, you 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 get yourself into a spotlight, and it's quite possible that you might get in trouble. Or, even physically attacked by, by some people or some um, extremists who see you as the traitor of their country. Because Thailand is, at least modern Thailand, is um, sort of sewn together by three principles. That's the, so the military, which is, they call it nation, which is basically military, um, the monarchy, and religion, which is Buddhism. They always say, oh, we accept all religions, but they give me Buddhism when they talk about religion. So if you question these three things, uh, you could get yourself in pretty serious trouble. But if, you, if we're friends talking, or you know, like, you, you, can, you can say anything in restaurants or in, in your social, uh, daily social life, but as a writer, it's difficult. Yes, and your yeah. work is out there in the public. Today. As an artist, as a writer, filmmaker, filmmaker it's quite difficult to criticize. Uh, and, and now, to criticize the military is the big, uh, is the big difficulty. Yeah. Prabhu, you, whose books are